20 past nine we're ready to go out that can mean only one thing we're with the air shows today and we're going to where are we going Chaz? we're going to an air museum somewhere down near Dumfries and Bob's driving so right, due to the fact that people are panic buying I have got enough diesel in my car at the moment to get us home well that's it, no, so, uh, seeing as Bob tows his car behind the, the van, seeing as Bob tows his car behind the van, he doesn't need the petrol in his car to get home. Right, let's go. Right, here we are, at Dumfries and Galloway Aviation Museum. Oh yeah, I'm going to have a look at the memorial garden. Commemorative display to parachute regiments and airborne forces dedication ceremony. The reference Dr. Paul Swin, chaplain to the 2nd Battalion Parachute Regiment, 5th of June 2005. <coughs> 1939 to 1945, dedicated to those personal values. In service of the country lost their lives flying from bases in Dumfries and Galloway. Not just today, but every day in silence we remember them. Two cappuccinos, please. Science coming soon, bear with us. <laughs> that reminds me of Granny's house. The Defence Medal, members of the Home Guard were entitled to claim the award for this medal. They needed to have completed three years, 1,080 days service between 14th of May 1940 and 31st of December 1944, when the young guy was stood down. Special award of the medal could be made in other circumstances. 78. The Master's Voice. Hello sir, what are you doing down there? Oh, you've got all the test, no one doing agony. Hmm. Oh yeah. Ooh, that's a big wheel. It's up there. <laughs> you missed it, you turned your back when I kicked it. <laughs> Lancaster Winter. Not too spit fire. Smell like a Murray Saint to me. This is a Murray Saint. Yeah, it's very similar, but it has something at the back of it. Telephone call, please. Nope. 
come and tell just ring the bell like hell <laughs> Yeah, take your mask off. We've all got our masks on, you keep yours. <laughs> well, the whole, the whole Spitfire uh, story started back in 1976 when the creator of the museum, David Reid, who's about there somewhere, came to the local Sabaka Club, of which I was a member, and said, There's a Spitfire in Loch Doon, would you like to, to go into my search for it? So we, we did a bit of search and we, we got the necessary permissions from the, from the Ministry of Defence and the landowners and the likes. And uh, we found a man who, as a 12 year old boy, had seen the plane crash in the loch. So we got him on site and uh, he could tell us roughly that the plane had, had crashed. But you have to remember, this is, this is 40 years after the event. So uh, anyway, that was a good starting off point for our uh, search. When we started the dive operations, uh, we found that there was a lot of peat in the water. So uh, the visibility was poor. And uh, when we got onto the bottom of the loch, there was a very fine silt, almost like a dust. If you go anywhere near it, it stirs up and you really can't see a thing. So the whole search was done by, by feel, Dutch. So anyway, um, we did, we devised a search method that took this into account and uh, we started off and uh, eventually we started to get some help from various divers up and down the country who had had the budgets through, through uh, the diary magazines and the likes. In particular, uh, an advanced project group from the Black Lawyer, uh, they were looking for a new project and uh, um, they used to come up the weekend to quite a few experienced divers uh, and that helped things considerably. However, after four years, we'd found nothing. And uh, we decided in 1982 that this was going to be our last year of searching. Coincidentally, we were moving into a new search area uh, and eventually we did find the Spitfire. What we found was a fuselage from just behind the cockpit back and on the tail, drawn on the You'll see from the film and these pictures in the first information board there uh, what we actually found. Obviously, it was in a poor state. However, you can see the, uh, the tail there actually on the film at the moment. We then had to continue the search for quite a while after that to find the rest of the plane. We still had to find the engine, the cockpit, the wings, and as much debris as we could to help us with the rebuilding process of the Spitfire. So the search went off quite a while. Because we had found the fuselage, we got the number for the plane, P7540. So that meant we could research its past history. Um, but remember, this is before the days of the internet and Google search and, and what have you. However, we did, we did find out that the plane had uh, first served uh, in late 1940 with the 66 Squadron based at Gravesend, Kent. Then, early 1941, it was transferred to two other squadrons briefly. By the time it was six months old, it was deemed to be obsolete. So it was given to a Czech squadron as a training Spitfire. I mean, if, if the speed of development of the Spitfire during the war was such that uh, if it lasted six months, it was, it was well out of date. But ours, ours was used as a training Spitfire. Now, the Czech squadron at the time was based at um, Prestwick in Scotland. When uh, when we were searching for the debris, uh, I was lucky enough to find the engine. That's the actual engine from it there. It was 
two feet below the silt at the bottom of the loch. But uh, that really preserved it, and, and uh, it's pretty much in working condition to this day. Um, the pilot, unfortunately, lost his life in the plane, and his remains were never recovered. Uh, he was a uh, Francis Eckel. He was a Czech pilot who, at the start of the war, flew with the Czech Air Force. Then, uh, when they were invaded, he escaped into Poland and flew briefly with the Polish Air Force. He was taken prisoner by Russians, escaped, made his way all the way across Europe to India. Then, somehow or other, he managed to get himself to the UK and join, join the Royal Air Force. Uh, and after some initial training in the south of England, he was assigned to the Czech squadron, as I say, was based at Preston. So that's where he first met in the hospital. Unfortunately, on his second flight, he was over up doing and the pressure there for a border. And he was too low over the water. And uh, he tried to back around in the wind to hit water. And uh, the plane sat cat wheeled and broke up. And unfortunately, he lost his life at the age of 26 after having achieved so much before that. However, uh, what makes this plane a little bit special is thanks to this gentleman here. Uh, this is quite the Bobby Oxford. This is the, this is the, the flight log of our Spitfire when the first one the service in October of 1947. Uh, it was flown almost exclusively by flight then uh, Bobby Oxford. Now he became quite a famous Spitfire pilot during the war. He was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross three times during the war, which in itself was quite there. And uh, after the war, he was the first pilot to fly a jet across the Atlantic Ocean to the Alcatraz of Canada. He was part of six partners across, across the Atlantic. After he left the Air Force in 1968 as a group captain, he wrote a book called Spitfire Commander. And in the book, uh, one section of the book is telling about his part in the Battle of Britain. Uh, sometimes he mentions dates from his own flying off. There's one date in particular, the 14th of November, intercepted a large gaggle of GU 87 stickers escorted by numerous 109s. That's messages. If you look at the same date on a plane, 14th of November, flight of the Mox interception patrol. Engaged ME109s and GU87s. So we know for a fact on that one, that one day at least, and probably others as well, but on that one day at least we know for a fact we find that plane in the map. And that, that's what makes it special. There's only, there's only a, a handful of map plans that are left. That could have been a map one or a map two. This is a map two A. The Spitfire went from before the war, the initial one, the, there was a Mark 1, uh, first one in 1986, and uh, went through to the Mark 24 uh, after the war. So this was a 2 We don't get another Mark 1 from Spitfire. There's this one here that still flies with the Mark 1 and the one that liked against the Collins Bay in Lincolnshire. So let me, let me go on the bits back to the museum here. We didn't have the facilities, we didn't have the knowledge, the capability, the equipment, anything that could leave on the strip bar. So all that had to be learned and got over the years. The best we ever had on the site here was polypan. That was our workshop, you know, workshop that we had in polypan. That was the best we had. So it was, it was all fully built in the polypan. We had to learn what to do and how to do it. When we came to the, the cockpit, uh, we wanted to make sure the cockpit was built like a Mark II would have been. So we went down to Collinsbury, we went all over that Spitfire to make sure that we rebuilt it uh, as it would have been. We used that as a template. And the battle of the Memorial Flight could tell us what to do and more important than what not to do. Uh, however, they did stress that 
we shouldn't be too hung up on originality because there's a constant upgrade going on all the time during the war. Once the updates going on. So, um, we got the fuselage more or less completed. And I mean, we couldn't buy bits for cockpit. We, we didn't have the money to buy the bits that were missing or the bits that were damaged. So we had to remake bits from the bits we found. We had, we, we, we had to remake them and bits that were missing. We had to find out what was missing. And we, we had to make, make a lot of fittings and so on for the cockpit ourselves. Um, when it came to the wings, what we had left of the wings was pretty well unusable. And uh, However, we did get a letter from the lawyer to say that this is the lady had died and we could let some money. Now, her husband had met here during the war and they had visited the museum in the early days and uh, the husband had subsequently died and when she died about five, six years ago, uh, the family decided they were obviously quite wealthy. They decided to leave money to a whole host of charities including our museum. So we were left enough money that allowed us to buy a set of glass fiber wings for the Spitfire. So that's a compromise that we made. Uh, so then we had to take the fuselage down to Cornwall to get the wings fitted. Uh, but the advantage of the glass fiber wings is that we can take them off quite easily, take the plane outside, put the wings back on for special events. But that was a compromise. Then I turned my attention to trying to find Bobby Oxman's plan when the door and the spitfire had been found to come out of the store. And uh, I traced it to the Grantham area in Lincolnshire. And I didn't find out much more than that. However, in a lot, my son's in the Air Force, he found Bobby Oxman's grave in Cranwell Village Cemetery near RAF Cranwell. And in RAF Cranwell they've got, they've got a college there and they've also got a Hall of Fame. And in the Hall of Fame there's a duplicate set of Bobby Oxford's medals and some other bits and pieces of family that they needed. So I was able to find out from the creator that, that they still had contact with his granddaughter who lived quite close by. So I sent him to see her, I got an email address, and I emailed her and told her the story of the search, the covering, and restoration of the plane. And I sent a photograph of it as it is. We, we built the shed ourselves, especially the pot. Uh, I sent a photograph of it as it is now, and, and uh, I got an extremely emotional email back, almost by the time. So she came up here with her two children, and they were the first ones to sit in the restored cockpit. And that was, that was a very special day. Uh, and she could tell us so much more about her grandfather that we didn't know. When Winston Churchill died in 1965, he got a state funeral. His coffin was carried up the Thames on a barge, then carried through London on a gun carriage, followed by royalty politicians, friends, family, whatever. But initially behind the coffin were five of the few. Now the few were specifically the fighter pilots from the back of from, from Church's own speech. Never in the field as you would point as so much we know by so many to so few. So five of the few were selected to fall immediately behind the coffin. And one of the five selected was Paul Gerson. So uh, he was obviously quite happy thought of at the time and it's sad to him find out so much more about our spectrum. We didn't know any of this when we died in the lock doom and even for years afterwards we didn't know any of this story. It's all
new set of mission boards so I can cite for people that who wish to help the baby to, just to keep us going. So thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Seven engines. That's run in model of RAF Dumfries in the middle of the wall. The runways and taxiways can be clearly be seen as can the control tower to the right of the north and south runway. From this it is easy to see the size of the airfield. It stretches from Angus to the north to the training and accommodation buildings to the south and the 220 engine former factory building in the west to the bomb dump to the east. There were even more buildings relating to the airfield, lying further airfield. Well, are you taking a picture of me? Taking a picture of you? Fraser Nash FN front gun turret. Off a bit, you know. Are you taking a photo, love? This museum is a work in progress, so a lot of these planes, although they're here, need work doing on them. Just thinking to myself, if that were yellow and black, it'd look like a bumblebee. This particular aircraft served with six feet six FTS and the Royal Air Force Co College. <laughs> this is an Orca Hunter F four WT. Seven four six. Never 
saw actual squadron service but was assigned to the MU Air Fighting Development Squadron before becoming an instructional airframe in the 1980s. That silver plane is a English Electric Lightning. Who's this we're finding down here in this air shelter? Oh, there's, a, there's another couple here. This is a strange looking aeroplane. One wonders what it is. It's got a great big fat thing underneath. It looks like it's pregnant. Very Garnet AEW.3XL497. This aircraft first flew in November 1960 and was assigned to 849 HQ flight Cold Rose in January 1966. It was shipped to Changi in the Far East and served for with 849C flights aboard HMS Art Royal and then with HMS Eagle was back in the UK by August 1968. XL497 has always been assigned to one of the 849 FLTs in addition to Cold Rose has been based at Brody, Yulvilton and Lossiemouth. Its last sea posting was with the HMS Art Royal. This aircraft was written off tra charge and became the Gates Guardian at the that's HMS Garnet Brestwick Airport in December 1978. It's arrived here on the 13th of April 2006. Yeah, uh, no. No. Dissolves MD452 Mystery first flew on 23rd of February 1951 and was a development of the MD450 Arigen. Lost a meter or T7 hybrid. See, they did hybrids in them days. <laughs> That's a funny looking helicopter. Oh, it's a glider. It's not an helicopter. Waco CG4 Adrian Assault Glider. Hotspur Glider. Different uniforms. Looks like a, it's a box of some description. It opens up. This was a thought was because there's a sign there that says Port Stanley. Yep, the Portland War was a 10 week undeclared war between Argentina and the United Kingdom. In 1982, over two British dependent territories in the South Atlantic, Portland's Island and its territorial defence, South Georgia and Sandwich Islands, the display will include both British and captured hydrogen equipment from the conflict. Bex, come here, love. Control Tower, listed building, Historic Scotland 2006, RF Dumfries. Oh my, oh my, oh my. Martin Baker, ejection seat. Very garnet engine. 
Hammer Strong Sidley Double Bander 102 Turbo Prop Vulcan XL321 Ejector Seat Martin Patterson Ejection Seat Rose Rose Kestrel Engine Mm. 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 Jumbo C1 B1 inverted B12 1200 HP record from ankle E11 crash sighting Kernsmore Fleet Split by ed 40 Blue Peter mm -hmm. Another Rolls Royce engine, some more ejector seats Sharon says it's a Pirelli. <laughs> There's another oh, it's a Rolls Royce helicopter. And this is a jet off a jet plane. Off a this is a Rolls Royce Spare 163 Dash Turbo Fan engine. Oh, Chris is the Trident Airliners. <laughs> this plaque can photograph, I remember it, of Sergeant Harry Parker, RAFVR, as much loved son and brother who perished with three other crew members when Wellington Bomber HG746 crashed on approach to this airfield on June 4th, 1943. Also, Sergeant Oliver Betteridge. RCAF who survived this accident but was later reported missing in action. This remembrance plaque was presented by Sergeant Parker's sister Kathleen Flint, 2014. Then come R680-13 engine. The Havlin Goblin 35 jet engine. Obviously, on this helicopter engine was fitted to the British at uh, Bristol Sycamore. Napier Gazelle jet engine. Bristol Sydney de Anverland Gyron Junior Turbo Jet. Remains of a Lockheed Hudson. 3 e 489 Maritime Reconnaissance Aircraft used by RAF, RAF Control Command in May 1939. Rolls Royce Avon 1C Turbo Jet. Rolls Royce Dart 5147. The Rolls Royce Dias engine was from a Fokker Friendship aircraft, VT Dunn, which served with Indian Airlines and later was seconded to the Indian Coast Guard and served with 700 Squadron Kolkata, providing maritime surveillance and SAR coverage for the West Bengal and other aerial coasts. Well, that's it for this. So, I um, hope you enjoyed watching and uh, I quite enjoyed the museum, it's good isn't it? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. That's that talk on the uh, Spitfire were really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope you enjoyed that. That was really interesting. I mean, how they pulled that out from that. No, oh, I don't know. So, yeah. Really good. So if you enjoyed the video, give us both a thumbs up. <laughs> and subscribe to both our channels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll bring you many more exciting adventures in the future. So thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>